This is the online lecture for Chapter 3, Part 1. You should use the information in this lecture to fill out the Chapter 3, Part 1 guided notes, and you, as always, should do this before you come to class. Now, in this part of the lecture, we're going to be discussing water and its actually very unique properties. All right, so water sounds exciting, right? Well, even though water is extremely common, common enough that it seems mundane and boring and kind of just average as a chemical, it's actually really interesting. If nothing else, consider these facts. 100% of drownings were known to involve water in some way. And 100% of serial killers have been known to drink water. So water is actually a really unique and can be a really exciting and dangerous chemical as well. In the right places, it can sustain life. In the wrong places, it can snuff life out. That's water. All living things depend on water. Water makes up somewhere between 70 and 95% of the volume of the average cell. Your body is about 70% water. That's a lot. Water is extremely abundant on our planet, and that's one of the things that makes the Earth pretty unique. Water covers about three-fourths of the Earth's surface, and it's one of the few chemicals that can be found in both a liquid, solid, and gaseous form in nature. Even though water is a very small molecule, it actually behaves in some really unique and interesting ways. And those properties come from the shape of the molecule. So I want you to think about this. Remember what you learned in the last chapter. Is water made of polar covalent bonds or nonpolar covalent bonds? Is it a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? And why? Now, of course, you learned in the last chapter that water is extremely polar. That means it's extremely lopsided. Within a water molecule, the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms can share the electrons, so they can zoom around the oxygen. They can also sometimes zoom around this hydrogen. But because oxygen is extremely electronegative, it's going to hog the electrons. And because it's hogging the electrons, that's going to give the oxygen a slight negative charge. It's also going to give the hydrogens a slight positive charge. So we have a lopsided molecule here with partial charges around the outside. And that's what allows it to do some of these really interesting, unique things. Imagine an Earth without water, life without water. We find it everywhere, in the atmosphere and below our feet. Three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by this essential liquid. It's a difficult thing to imagine life without water, because our own survival depends on it. In fact, water is vital to the existence of all forms of life on Earth. Water, or H2O, is an unusual compound with amazing properties. These unique properties are what make it so important to life. First of all, water happens to be the only substance on Earth that can be found naturally in all three states, as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. It is rare in that it actually expands as a solid, which is why ice can float. Pure water is essentially colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Water has a neutral pH, which means it is neither acidic nor basic. Water has been called the universal solvent because it can dissolve many substances. Wherever water goes, either through the atmosphere, the earth, or through our bodies, it takes along valuable chemicals, minerals, and nutrients. This is one reason why water accounts for about 70% of the weight of a cell, which is the building block of life.
water has high specific heat, which means it absorbs a lot of heat before it changes temperature. This is why water makes a great coolant. This is also why oceans, lakes, and water vapor in the atmosphere help to regulate the Earth's temperature. Water molecules are sticky. They attract to each other, which is why water tends to flow together, fall as raindrops, and beat up on the surface of a leaf. This property is the result of cohesion. To understand cohesion, let's imagine we're recreating a water molecule. A water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Because of the molecule's arrangement and the electronegativity difference between the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom, the molecule becomes polar. The oxygen atom has a negative charge while the hydrogen atoms have a positive charge. Since we all know opposites attract, the oxygen atom will stick to a nearby hydrogen atom. The result is a strong bond. Surface tension is a result of cohesion and is the measure of how difficult it is to break the surface of a liquid. We can observe the high surface tension of water by watching this mosquito step onto its surface or this insect, as it struggles to free itself from a droplet. Surface tension is also what causes a water droplet to take a spherical shape. Water is the most cohesive of all non-metallic liquids. Adhesion is similar to cohesion, but refers to two different surfaces or molecules with an attraction to one another. This is why the droplet sticks to this leaf. Along with cohesion, Adhesion is responsible for a phenomenon called capillary action. Capillary action is the force that pulls water upward against gravity through a narrow tube. This is an essential property for plants, which rely on capillary action to pull water from their roots up to their leaves. So it's pretty obvious that water is important stuff. Humans rely on it for personal consumption as well as things like industry, energy production, and agriculture. But we sometimes have a tendency to use more than we need and pollute what's left. We need to make sure we keep it pure and plentiful. And because water is so polar, it is an excellent solvent. In fact, we call it the universal solvent, although that's a little bit of a misnomer, as I'll explain in a second. So what is a solvent? Well, a solvent is a chemical that dissolves other chemicals. So you can imagine water dissolving salt. It's acting as a solvent. The thing that's being dissolved is called a solute. So the salt would act as the solute in this case. And collectively, sol solvent and solute together are called a solution. So water is a universal solvent. That means it dissolves a whole lot of stuff. How does it do this? Well, let's take salt water as an example. When you mix salt with water, the water molecules go in and they push the sodium ions apart from the chlorine ions. In other words, they break the ionic bonds that were holding those crystals together. And look at how they arrange themselves around those crystals. Here, the water has put its negative charge as close to that positively charged ion as possible. And over here, it's flipped over. It's put its positive hydrogen as close to this negative chlorine as it can possibly get. So these water molecules are surrounding these ions and pushing them apart. And that's the reason that salt crystals break apart and appear to disappear when you mix them with water. Now, is water really a universal solvent? Can it dissolve anything? Well, no, of course not. If it could dissolve anything, you couldn't keep it in a cup. You couldn't keep it inside your body. 
So there are some things that water doesn't like to mix with, doesn't like to dissolve. But in general, because water is so polar, it will mix with anything with charges. So ions or other polar molecules. Here are a couple of vocabulary terms that describe how water likes to interact with other chemicals. First we have hydrophilic. Now that word literally means water loving. So things that have charges, ions and other polar molecules are hydrophilic. Water really likes to mix with it. So here for instance we have one of those quick dissolving tablets. It's very hydrophilic. Things like salt and sugar, um, those things are also very hydrophilic. The opposite of that is hydrophobic. That literally means water fearing. So some molecules don't like to mix with water, like oil, which you can see over here. Oil is very hydrophobic. Oil tends to be very nonpolar. So things that lack charges and or are nonpolar tend to be hydrophobic. They don't like to mix with water. Water will even attempt to interact with large molecules. Here we see a bunch of water molecules trying to dissolve this big protein molecule here. This protein thing has some little uh, charges on the outside, and so you can see that the water is attracted to those charges, forming hydrogen bonds with it. Now since it can't break it apart, it will form all around the outside of this little protein, um, and it forms something known as a hydration shell. Here's a cute little way to quiz yourself on hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Take a look at this cat. How would you classify it? Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? You don't have to write your answer to this one down. At the bottom of the page there, you'll see that I've posed an I don't know question, an IDK question. Now to remind you what these are, um, anytime you come up with a question and I don't know the answer to it, or I just think it's a neat question, I will send you guys out to try and answer it. You can look online or at other sources, write up an answer, and post that on Blackboard with a source. If I like your answer and it's a good source, I will give you two points towards your next test grade. Now here's the I don't know question this time. Um, there is actually a disease out there known as hydrophobia, and it's not the fear of water. It's not the psychological fear of water, it's something else. But there's another contagious disease called hydrophobia. I want you to go out and see if you can figure out what the old name for this is. Best of luck. The second unique property is water's ability to hydrogen bond with things. Now we talked about what the hydrogen bond is in the last chapter. Remember that it results from molecules that are polar, that have these little partial charges, um, and water is definitely polar. So when you put water molecules together, the positive parts and the negative parts of different molecules are going to be attracted to each other, and we represent that with that little dotted line. When water molecules stick to each other, we call that cohesion. When water molecules stick to other things, anything else with a charge, we call that adhesion. An easy way to remember this is to think of adhesive tape. Adhesive tape will stick to just about anything, right? So it's being adhesive. Water's ability to hydrogen bond is what allows it to form a surface tension. In other words, water kind of forms a little skin on the outside. And this occurs because the water molecules are more attracted to each other than they are to the air. So they make this little skin, and this is what allows them to form things like droplets. You may have experienced a surface tension if you've ever done a belly flop into a pool. Because all of your skin is hitting all of that surface tension at once, and you have to break through it, it makes a loud slap, and it hurts. This ability to hydrogen bond is important to living things for several different reasons. One of the most important things that water can do because of its ability to hydrogen bond is to perform something called capillary action. So let's take a tree for example. Inside a tree there are tiny, tiny, tiny little tubes called xylem and phloem formed by the cells. And water travels from the roots, 
from the ground into the roots, into the stem, into the leaves, and then it comes out of the leaves and into the air. This is something called transpiration. Now this is called capillary action because the tubes are very, very small. And what's happening inside those tubes is that the water molecules are cohering to one another. They're also adhering to the walls of those tubes. And they're literally climbing one another up the tree and out of the leaves. Transpiration is what allows plants to pull nutrients and salts and things they need up into their cells as well. So trees wouldn't be able to do this if water couldn't hydrogen bond. The ability to hydrogen bond is important to life in some other ways as well. This is what allows water to kind of stick to the inside of cells. It's what allows certain organisms like insects to walk on water. And it also allows certain organisms to form bubbles. Here, for instance, is a cool little spider that lives in fresh water. Um, it's known as a pisarid or a fishing spider. And what this little guy will do is make a bubble filled with air, and then it actually goes under the water to hunt fish and little insect larvae and things like that. So it makes a bubble, and that is its scuba tank, and it takes it under the water with it. And it couldn't do that if water couldn't hydrogen bond. Unique property number three, water is less dense as a solid. Now with most chemicals, as they get close to the freezing point, the molecules will actually pull closer together, so it becomes denser and denser. Water, though, is very unique, and this again relates to its ability to hydrogen bond. When it gets between one and zero Celsius, getting really close to that freezing point, the molecules actually begin to push each other apart a little bit. They won't get any closer than that hydrogen bond allows them to. So they push each other apart a little bit and that makes ice less dense than liquid water. Now what does that mean? Well that means that if you put some ice on some liquid water it will float because the ice is less dense. This property is important to living things for a couple of different reasons. For one thing, solid water being less dense than liquid water means that ice will actually float on top of a lake instead of sinking. If the opposite were true, then every time the ice were to freeze in the cold season, it would sink to the bottom of the lake, for instance, and it would sit there in a layer, and it wouldn't melt during the summer. The next year, when it got cold again, more ice would form. It would make a second layer, and it would just sit down there. The next year, it would freeze again, more ice would form. So these fresh water sources would freeze from the bottom up. The presence of ice is also important as an insulator. Now you might have felt sorry for fish living under the ice um, in the winter time, but actually that ice is protecting them. It's ensuring that that water under the ice stays just above freezing, um, whereas the air above the ice might get even colder than freezing, and it allows those organisms to live down there. There are certain ecosystems that are formed because of ice. For instance, the giant ice sheets where polar bears are known to hunt during the winter months. Now we're going to talk about pH more in the second part of this chapter and also in lab three, but for now you need to know that the pH scale is actually based on water and that water has a pH of seven. Pure, pure water is neutral. It's neither an acid nor a base, and so it has a pH of seven. The fifth unique property of water is its high heat capacity. Now you've probably experienced the heat capacity of water, um, maybe in the winter time. I certainly did the first year I moved to Austin. First year I moved to Austin, I noticed the bathing suits were for sale all year round here, which is kind of unique. So I thought, well, hey, you know, the air is warm outside, let's go for a swim. So my husband and I went over to the apartment pool and jumped in and it felt basically like this. That water was freezing. So why is it that the water's so cold if the air is in the 90s and hot? Well, it's because of water's high heat capacity. 
you have to add a lot of heat energy to water to get its temperature to change. Conversely, you have to take a lot of heat out of water to get it to cool off. So that water was cold, and it was still cold after the winter months, and it takes a long time for it to absorb enough heat from the air to be nice to swim in. Now this property is really important environmentally to many different ecosystems. It allows water to sort of absorb heat during the day and sort of release it at night, and so that keeps the temperature of ecosystems near water sources a little bit more stable. Here you can see a demonstration of the high heat capacity of water and its effect on certain ecosystems. Here we have the coast of California. And what you can see here is that the temperatures taken at this time along the coast are cooler than those taken inland. Now why is this? What's the water doing? Well, the water has to absorb a lot more heat than the air before it heats up. So the areas closest to the water are remaining cooler than those inland. Rock, soil, and air have a lower specific heat so they can change really rapidly. This is also important because it means that the temperature of our bodies um, isn't going to change rapidly because the temperature of the water in our bodies is going to remain pretty stable. Property number six relates a lot to property number five, the, the high heat capacity. Um, water has a very high heat of vaporization. And what that means is that you have to add a lot of heat energy to it to get it to evaporate, to go from a liquid to a gas. Conversely, you have to take a lot of heat energy out to get it to go from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. This is what allows the water cycle that you learned about in elementary school to work. It also allows for evaporative cooling. When you sweat, the water in the sweat is going to absorb a lot of heat energy before it evaporates. And when it evaporates, it will carry all that heat energy away from your body. So that's the reason that sweat cools you off. This also helps prevent cells and ecosystems from losing too much water due to evaporation. It means that if we turn the temperature in the room up a couple degrees, you're not going to lose all your water to evaporation and dehydrate and die. Property number seven has to do with the reactivity of water. Now we think of water as being kind of mundane, kind of boring, that it's non-reactive, right? It's kind of a background chemical, but it actually plays a part in a lot of important chemical reactions. Now just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, this side of this chemical equation is called the reactants. Those are like the ingredients going in. And this side of the equation represents the products. That's what comes out of the reaction. In general, the arrow will point towards the products. What you can see in this reaction is that water is both a reactant and a product in this reaction, and it happens to be photosynthesis. Unique property number eight has to do with the compression of water. Because of the hydrogen bonding between the molecules, water molecules are already as close together as they want to be. So if you put pressure on them, you're not going to be able to crunch them any closer together. Now that provides kind of a good stable platform to build a cell or a body around, and it makes water sort of more reliable. Now it is possible to compress water, but you would need, essentially need the forces found in the center of the sun, that kind of a thing. So water does not compress very well. Here's a your turn for you to complete in your notes. Here we have a concept map. On this concept map, there are eight water droplets. And what I want you to do is to summarize the eight properties of water, one on each water droplet. So try to summarize it in one, two, three words, maybe. Keep it a, maybe a really short phrase. And then write that over those eight droplets. It seems silly, but it may help you remember it a little bit better. Just a little more reinforcement.
In this year turn, I want you to look at these pictures and tell me which property or properties of water each represents and write it on there. A couple of these pictures may represent more than one of water's properties. Also, you should know that water's inability to compress is not on here, so that one won't rep be represented in these pictures. So hooray, you are officially finished with this section of the chapter. You are now ready to attend the class for chapter three, part one.